If you would, take your Bibles with me this morning. We're going to be starting in Luke, Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 1. It says, Now when he concluded his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. And when Jesus went with them, and he was walking already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Let's stop here for just a moment. We start reading in this chapter, and it's interesting. You have a Gentile, not a Jew, but a Gentile, seeking the help of Jesus Christ. Now, he tells him, he says, I've got a servant. He's dear to me. I love him. He says, and he's dying. He's sick. I need your help. So he sends Jew, Jewish elders, men of respect, to Jesus. And the first thing they tell Jesus is something that you and I might be tempted to do at times in our own life. First thing they tell him is they say, Lord, this man is worthy that you should do this for him. And they kind of break down a list of the good things this man has done. They say he loves our nation. He built us a synagogue. God, he's, he's done wonderful things for our nation. You should do this for this man. Isn't it kind of interesting how we feel like at times that we need to qualify why God should hear our prayer or why God should do things for us? You can't help it at times. We just we tend to do it, and that's exactly what they do here. This man was a Gentile, so they think we need to give God a reason. We need to give Jesus a reason why he should help this individual. So they start explaining to him all the good things he's done, how he's such a good, righteous individual. And then you start reading in the following verses, and what happens? The centurion sends friends to Jesus, friends of his, to Christ as he gets close to his home. And the first thing that the centurion has them say, I am not worthy. Very first thing he has them say. Here everyone else is talking him up. They're saying he's a good man, he's a great man, he's done great works for us. But the very first thing this man says to Jesus, I am not worthy. See, there's things we know about ourselves that nobody else knows. We can put on a good front, we can, we can look good for everybody else, but there are things that nobody will ever know about us that we know. And here Jesus is coming to this man's home, and he says, Lord, if they only knew, I'm not worthy that you should come into my home and do this thing. But in saying that statement, he shows Jesus something that he's not seen anywhere else. Look at what follows in this, in this story as we go just a little bit further. Look at what comes next. He says, I am not worthy. Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now listen to the, to the rationale that the centurion has. When I, when I read that, when I read that, I think to myself, man, this is just common everyday logic. He says, I know how this works. He says, Lord, he says Jesus, I don't see you as just a miracle worker. You have authority that I've not seen anybody else have. You're in a position of power. Either you're God or you have God's ear because when you speak, things happen. And he says, I know how this works because I have authority myself. I can say to a servant, come and he comes. Another one, go and he goes. You speak a word and angels show up. 
you say one word and an angel goes before you to do your bidding. He says, I know how this works. So he says, Lord, though I'm not worthy, all I need you to do is speak a word and it's done. Just speak a word and it's done. You know what the centurion asked Jesus to do then is the same thing that we look for Jesus to do now. He didn't know Jesus so much in the flesh. He didn't walk with him. He wasn't a disciple of Jesus. But he knew that the word of God had enough power that it's all he needed to fix his problem. You and I carry the word of God with us today. We carry it with us everywhere we go. And we can understand how authority works because we see it every day in the workplace. Someone says, I need this done, it gets done. He says, I know how this works. I'm a military man. I know that your words contain power. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Because I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. That's not necessary. You look at the content of what this man is saying. It's exactly the sinner's prayer in Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13. It's exactly what it contains right there. He admits, I'm a sinner. I need grace. I believe in you. I surrender. All these ingredients right there. And when Jesus hears all of this, and he hears the petition of this man. In verse 9 it says, Jesus heard these things, he marveled. And he turned around and he said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Church, that part of the story right there is a wake-up call to the church. Because Jesus says, not even among my chosen people have I seen such belief and faith. Not even in the promised land itself, among the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have I seen such faith. And this came from a Gentile, a Roman, someone who is responsible for being a part of the oppression of God's people. He knows he's done wrong. He knows his country's not right. He knows there's a thousand different things of why Jesus should turn and walk away. That's why the preface of all this is, I'm not worthy. I don't care what everyone else said. I don't care how they told you I did great things and wonderful works and everything else. They don't know me like I know me. I'm not worthy you should come into my home. But you have authority. You can speak and it's done. I believe in you. And that moment, if you read the next verse, that moment when his friends go back to the house, it's been done as the Lord said, his servant was healed. Such a lesson in faith. And what's the challenge for you and I today? What was the point of saying that not even Israel had this kind of faith? It's because church, sometimes that when we have such access to God that we can go to him whenever we forget how special it is, how powerful it is, how great God is, how capable he is. We forget. I remember growing up, I had friends that weren't allowed to have sugar. Their parents cut it out and said, no sugar. We had a candy dish on the table. And for us, we had access to that candy dish all the time. We never really ate that much candy because it wasn't anything special. We'd get a piece every now and then, but it wasn't special. It was no big deal. When my friends came over, They were like a wood chipper in a forest. I mean, they were chipping through that candy like it was going to jump up and leave the dish before they were done. They were scarfing it down. I'm looking at them like, slow your roll, guys. It's okay. Like, oh, no, we don't get this at home. We got to make hay while the sun's shining. And, buddy, when they're done, they look like chipmunks just found a nut stash. I mean, their cheeks are puffed out to here, full of chocolate and candy. You see, this centurion, for him it was such that I've never had access to anything like this before. I never had the promise of a Messiah. I'm a Roman. I have my own gods, but they don't listen to me. But you, Jesus, you're something different. 
you have authority. And he realizes how special Christ is. And he just, he's so in awe, but also so humble, he can't even approach him. The Jews have been promised God for centuries. They've looked for Him in their own special way. They've seen the miracles of God generation after generation. They've become stiff-necked and proud. When Jesus shows up, they don't see Him necessarily at first the way that others do. This centurion was looking for God, and he found Him. We go a little bit further in Scripture, and I want to take you on over to Hebrews 11.6. Now this is important as Christian believers, as men and women of faith, this scripture is so important for us today. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Look at that first part of the verse. It is so direct, it's so simple to grasp, it's not complicated at all. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That means you can do a lot of things in your life. You can be much like this centurion. You could do amazing things. You could build synagogues. You could do amazing, amazing good works. But this scripture alone, and there's many to back it up, but if you don't believe, if you do not have faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible. You must have faith if you're going to serve Jesus Christ. This is one of the things that was so hard for me to grasp as a kid because I constantly wanted to see proof. I wanted to constantly find answers. I wanted it to be put right in front of me, quantified, be able to pick it up and say, there it is. But the fact is you have to operate from a stance of faith, believing without seeing that God is able to do exactly what He says He can do, to be able to accomplish the impossible today. And people ask you, say, well, where is it? Say, I believe. I have faith. I believe. You say, you're not perfect. I know. But I believe. See, it wasn't a matter of the centurion being perfect. He didn't have to be perfect. It was a question of he had to be humble. He had to acknowledge he made mistakes. And he had to believe that God is able to do exactly what he needed him to do that day. And he did all these things. The centurion wasn't proud trying to put on a show. He wasn't trying to look so big and bad at this point. He was saying, I know I'm not worthy, but I believe that Jesus is able to do it. I know that I can't approach Him directly because I'm a sinner, but I believe that He will hear me. And to go on and make your petition, make your request known to God. Church is one of the most challenging things that we can do as believers is to operate by faith. To operate by faith. Because when we come and we pray and we make our petitions known to God when we claim the Scriptures, oftentimes things don't change right away. They continue on the way they have for a long time. And we sit back and we have to choose. This is Joshua 20, 23. Uh, my brain just died on me for a moment. Joshua 23, 15. Choose this day who you will serve. This is the challenge right there. To say, I'm not serving God because everything's going to change in my life in this second. I'm not serving God because all of a sudden my life's going to get monumentally better. I serve God today because I believe that He is God. I believe that He hears me when I call on His name. I believe that God won't leave me stranded where I am right now. He will hear me. I'm going to hold on to Him. And I'm going to trust that God is going to deliver. That's faith. That's faith right there. The substance of things that we hope for. The evidence of things that we cannot see. Scripture states that you cannot please God when you operate without faith. You cannot do it. Works will not do it. You must operate by faith. I love a quote by Philip, Billy Graham. He says, God does not reward fruitfulness. He will reward faithfulness. This is one of the, the mistakes that we make. We think, well, you know, when we, see, when we see numbers, when we see things get better, when I see more money in the bank account, when I see 
bet people doing better things, when I, when I see numbers returning back to the church, when I see all these things, then I know God is working. Hogwash! You filled your head with something that's not biblical nor true. God looks for faithfulness. He looks for the change to take place inwardly first, not outwardly. The change takes place inside of here first. What do you see in the centurion's story? You see a man's heart changing before your eyes. The miracle, the first miracle done was not the miracle of Jesus healing the servant. The first miracle that was done was a Gentile confessing that he is a sinner before a Jewish God and saying, I'm not worthy. Do you realize in the Roman Empire he could have very well been put to death for such a statement? He's saying this to a Jew. The whole precept of the Roman Empire was they were better than everybody else. And here he is humbling himself before a Jewish Messiah to say, I am not worthy. I don't care if it cost me my life. I don't care if it cost me my position. I really don't care. Because I know I'm speaking to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And the truth is is that when I stand before you, I know I am not worthy to be in your presence. But I believe in you. But I believe in you. The first miracle in that story was the change that took place inside of that centurion. The second miracle was the servant being healed. That was the order that takes place. Now today, look at the church. What's the first miracle that needs to take place in the church? It needs to take place inside the church. Inside the character of the church. The heart of the church. That's where it needs to happen first. Look at our homes. Look at our marriages. Look at our children. Where's the first place the miracle needs to happen? Inside of us. In our children. In our marriage. In our home. Inside of us. The change takes place inwardly first. And then it is seen outwardly that's why god doesn't reward fruitfulness he rewards faithfulness because faithfulness leads to fruitfulness not the reverse not the reverse i remember a couple years ago my wife and i decided we wanted to try to grow our own peaches so we went out and we bought a couple peach trees and we planted them and they were looking pretty good they were looking pretty no peaches on them but they were looking pretty good I went, to, I went to Apple Acres that first year, and I bought peaches. Seems kind of odd, doesn't it? I buy a peach tree, and then I have to go buy peaches. Well, the fact is, I'm not going to get peaches off those trees until they start growing first. First comes the tree, then comes the fruit, then comes the peach. I don't get the peach first and then the tree. That doesn't work that way. The tree's got to grow first. Now, granted, I still don't have peaches, but that's because of a squirrel, not because of anything the tree did. You go to Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, we start looking at this passage, and it is a warning to the church. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's a sad verse multiple sad verses it's talking about a people who know about God but they don't know him you look at the centurion his heart was to get right with God and see his servant heal the challenge we face today is we see a lot of people they have no desire to get right with God but they have a desire to be used by God And this scripture right here saying there's going to be a lot of folks come judgment day that stand before him and they're going to say, Lord, we've done a lot of good works for you. We've done a lot of good things in your name. But it comes back to that quote by Billy Graham. You tried to be fruitful, but you were never faithful. You were never faithful. 
say, Pastor, what do you mean by faithful? Faithful means a lot of things. It means serving God in obedience. Not serving God and just attending church. Not serving God and just trying to look good and do the right things around the right people. It means being obedient to the Word of God. Doing what it commands. It also means sometimes standing alone. Standing alone. The Bible tells us we're not going to be popular. It tells us that we're not always going to be surrounded by a large group of people supporting us. That there will be times that you stand alone. And that's being faithful. Look at the things the Scripture is saying here. It's saying, did we not prophesy in your name? There are many prophets back in Scripture. There are many of them. Jeremiah is full of them. Full of prophets that wanted to tell people exactly what they wanted to hear. And he called them out for it. We're again full of prophets in Scripture that did the right thing for a time and then fell away. And the Bible states that there's going to be many of those prophets say, Lord, we did great things for you back in the day. God's challenge is, but you did not learn to be faithful. You didn't learn to be faithful. Come back and say, but Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Lord, how could I cast out a demon and not be right with you? God says again, you bore fruit at one time, but you were never faithful to me. See, church, faithfulness is about finding God, serving Him consistently throughout your life, searching for Him. When Jesus came to the centurion, buddy, there was a gut check that happened. Look at what the Jews stated in the beginning of the story. He has built synagogues for us. He loves our nation. To the Jews, they're saying, man, this is a holy man. This is a righteous Gentile. He's doing good works. Then Jesus shows up. And even from afar off, maybe the centurion saw him. And he sends messengers to him. He says, Lord, I'm not even worthy. Man, he must have thought he was before. But man, something happened where he looked inside and he goes, no. No, what I did with that synagogue, that wasn't even touching it. That's not even remotely close. My love for Israel, that's not even to touch it. That's not even the beginning, God. Now I'm looking at you. I am not worthy. I'm not worthy. And you look at this right here, and this is exactly what God's talking about. All these people He's referring to, all the excuses they give are them trying to tell God they are worthy to be in His presence. The centurion was the opposite. He's saying, I am not worthy. Look in verse 23. It says, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Now listen to this last part. You who practice lawlessness. You see, if you're kind of scratching your head and you're wondering what's going on here, that last line clears it up very perfectly. They never served God. They practiced what was lawlessness. And because of that, God said, I never knew you. That clears it up right there, very easy. You want to say, oh, pastor, what's keeping the law? It's being obedient to God, desiring righteousness, desiring to be holy, desiring to serve God in faithfulness and truth. It's not trying to please the world on one hand and please God on the other. It's learning how to please God fully with all your heart. The centurion wasn't saying he's not worthy because he didn't love God. He's saying he's not worthy because he realizes I've got a lot of growing to do. There's a lot of things I realize now that I need to clean up in my life. That's what he's saying. He desires to know God. The challenge is today as a church, we often don't desire to know him. We're comfortable being right where we are. And we don't want to go any deeper. If I go deeper, that means I've got to change things. If I go deeper, that means I've got to, I've got to change how I talk. That may be how I, I change how I dress. That means I've got to change the company I keep. Yes. Serving God requires change. You cannot be who you were yesterday. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, if anyone be in Christ, 
you are a new creation, meaning something has changed. The old has passed away. All things are made new. You're new in Christ. If you want to know Him, you must be changed by Him. The centurion was changed being in His presence. The disciples were changed being in His presence. Saul was changed to Paul by being in His presence. And now you have this passage here. There are men saying, we did great works for you. But the very last verse states, but you never changed. You still practiced lawlessness. You tried to do good works and you thought that would be enough. You thought being a good person would be enough. You thought that doing all these things for me would be enough. But you still practice what is lawlessness in the Word of God. Today we see it happening all over the nation, all over the world. Churches adopting doctrines of man and calling it a doctrine of God. Hogwash! The Word of God does not change. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. And we continue on the same line. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in 8 and going to verse 9. Listen to these verses. It says, For grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift from God, not of works, lest anyone should boast it says it right there in plain English it's not about the things that you do that make you holy you cannot be holy and not accept the grace of God you say pastor what is the grace of God you've talked about doing good works you've talked about being holy but now you're saying it's not about works what are you saying I'm saying that works alone cannot save you that's what we were looking at before. People coming to Christ and saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? If I prophesy, then I'm in, in your good graces, am I not? Not necessarily. So I cast out demons. I must be in your good graces. Am I, am I right with you? Not necessarily. So well, how do I get in your good graces? Romans 10, 9 and 10 and 13. I must confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in my heart that God has raised Him from the dead, and I shall be saved. For with confession, with, with confession, the, excuse me, for with the mouth confession is made, and through the heart one believes unto salvation. I have to repent and confess Jesus Christ. That's how it starts. When you look at the story with the centurion, he confessed, I'm a sinner. He acknowledged that Jesus had authority, that He was who He said He was. You see a sinner's prayer right there. The contents of it, the framework of it is right there in that story. His walk for God started that day. But his walk for God did not end there. He had to continue to grow in the grace of God. He had to continue to know Him as His Lord and His Savior. The same as the disciples. The same as the apostles. He had to learn how to follow that model. And now for us today, He tells us, you're not going to be saved by doing good works alone for Christ. You must confess your sins. You must have a life for Jesus Christ. You must be holy in the sight of God by living for Him every day of your life. I was talking to my son the other day. We were having this big conversation because you know he's going to be a teenager next year. So I'm having this big conversation. And he tells me, he says, now dad... He says, I want to work. I said, you do? He goes, yes, I want a job, I want to make money. I said, that's good. That's a wonderful thing, son, I want you to. He goes, so what do I have to do? I said, well, I said, you, you have to learn to be responsible, focused, follow direction. He said, I can do all those things. I said, that is wonderful. So I have something I need you to do. He goes, what's that? I said, go clean your room. He goes, well, it is clean. I said, it is. He goes, yes, it's clean. I, I, I cleaned it all up. I said, that's great. So it's ready for me to go take a look at it. Give me one minute. I said, okay. 
So he goes and he's cleaning up everything. Comes back five minutes later. And he's getting in the kitchen. He's getting a snack. I said, son? He goes, yeah. I said, how's the room looking? He goes, what about it? I said, did you clean your room? I need a minute. This went on for a while. And eventually I looked at him and I said, now son, I said, you remember what I was telling you about getting a job and following orders and being responsible and all that? And he goes, yeah. I said, part of that is follow through. You tell me that you want to, that you can follow instruction, you do a good job. He goes, yes. I said, then why is it that every time I ask you to clean your room, I find you doing something else? And why is it that every time I tell you I'm going to go look at it, you tell me you're going to go back and work on it some more? You see, the thing is, he gets easily distracted. His intentions are great. He has every intention to follow through and do what he needs to do. But he gets distracted so easily. As a Christian, we are absolutely no different. We may have a heart to do the right thing. A heart to live righteously, to do the things of God. But we get so easily distracted. And the sad truth is, if we don't learn how to focus on God, it could very well wind up being one of these things where the Lord says, I don't know you. I don't know you. You never obeyed me. You never followed my commandments. You never stopped to realize, like the centurion, that you're not worthy of being in my presence. Church, make no mistake, no, none of us are worthy to stand before God. We're redeemed. There's a difference. But when I recognize that I'm not worthy, I become more dependent on Jesus. I lean on Him so much more because I know where I stand. I know who I am. I don't say this to beat up on myself or anyone else. I say it to emphasize the importance of Jesus. Without Him, no man can stand before God the Father. The centurion recognized that. That's why he said, I'm not worthy. He became dependent on Jesus. I need to be dependent upon Christ. When I become dependent upon Him... I realize that nothing I do is going to be good enough. Only what I create in a relationship with Christ will stand before God the Father. That's why reading your Bible is so important. You're cultivating, you're building that relationship with Christ. You're becoming dependent upon Him. That's why prayer is so essential. I'm learning to have a conversation with God and listen to His guidance. That's why knowing the commandments are so important. They illuminate for me those areas of my life that I need to work on and fix to show me where I do fall short. Not to grind me into the dust, but to help me get up out of it. The Bible's not oppression. It's life. Without it, I don't know who I am. I don't know where I truly stand. It's difficult at times, even painful, when the Bible shows me how short of God I really am, how much I've really failed. I don't like that when the Bible does it to me. But for me to inherit eternal life, I need to see where I stand. And the Bible shows me that out of love and compassion. And in those moments, I do become like the centurion, and I realize I'm not, I'm not the best person in the room. I'm not the most righteous. I'm not the most holy. I'm not the one that has it all figured out. I'm fallen. I'm flawed. I need a Savior. 
And that's where the beautiful Scripture comes in. By grace are you saved. I'm adopted into God's family through His grace. Not because I did anything to deserve it. Not because of the works I've done. But because He was gracious enough to give me a gift. And now it's my turn to do my part. I live for Him. I live for Him. Music can come on forward. Living for Christ is letting go of all those things of this world. Letting go of them. Letting go. It's hard to let go at first because you think you have something good. You think you've got something that's really going to mean something. But in reality, you don't have much. You're holding on to something that the Lord is wanting to give you something so much better if you just let go. Just let go. And follow after Christ. I tell you one thing that just seems to consume so many people. And there are times that it even has consumed me in my life. Anger. Resentment. Or bitterness. Letting go of what someone's done to hurt you or, or cause you pain. Because you feel like if you do that, you're giving them a pass. You're letting them walk. And you don't want to do that. Because they deserve to be judged for what they did. In reality, you're not judging anybody. You're bringing judgment upon yourself. You're bringing all that pain and that burden on yourself. And when you give it to God, you start realizing what you've been carrying all these years. You don't realize how heavy of a burden it was. You got used to it. But when you let go, it just feels like you've been set free because you have. There's so many things, so many things that get in the way. You look at this Roman centurion. Ask yourself this question. The day that Jesus came, how many Jews were staring him down because he was a Roman? How many Jews hated him even though he did good for him? Because he was a part of Rome. Ask yourself, how many innocent people did he have a hand in persecuting, murdering, because Rome told him to? How many idols were in his home? He was a Gentile, after all, a Roman. How many times did he pray to those idols when God was walking the earth? And now he has someone who's sick. Someone he cares about. Now comes a point where he's got to make a decision. He's tried to buy the approval of all the Jews around him. For some, he's been successful. He did buy it. There are others who still hate him. And now he's got to reach out to a Jew. A Jew who is the Messiah. He knows he's not worthy. He knows that he needs to change some things. But at this point, He's got somebody in need and it can't wait. So he figures, he goes, here's what I'll do. I won't go to Jesus. He probably won't receive me if I do. Even if I did, I know what I am. I'll send Jewish leaders who like me. I'll send them to go get his attention. So these elders go and they tell Jesus he's built us a synagogue he loves our people he deserves for you to come and do this for him Jesus starts walking that way but somewhere somewhere close to this man's home he sees the king of kings and the lord of lords there's a panic that comes over him. He starts realizing all that's wrong with his life, 
all the mistakes he's made, things he's never even thought of before. And he sends word to Jesus, don't come. Don't come. I'm a sinner. Nothing I've done will erase that. Nothing will undo the guilt and the pain that I feel. Nothing will erase the torments that haunt me inside. My house is in disrepair for you. I've got idols around my home representing Rome. I'm one of the persecutors of your people. Don't come into my house. But if you will, if you could please just say one word, just one word. I know I don't don't deserve it. I see what kind of man I am now. But if you could just say a word, I know the Father listens to you. I know that things happen when you speak. So speak for me. Speak for me. That's a prayer I want to pray. Lord, speak for me. Speak for me to your Father in heaven. Speak to me when I'm not worthy. Speak for me when I fall. Show me where I need to change. I feel like I'm doing pretty good until I look at you. I realize I need a lot more work. Church, God loves you. But He's calling you to greater things. You can't get there by holding on to the past. You can't get there by thinking that you're doing better than everyone else. You certainly can't get there by playing games. It's time to take a deep look inside. Take a deep, deep look and ask yourself one question. Am I ready? Am I ready for Jesus to come into my house? Whatever needs you need to pray, whatever God has laid on your heart, or anything that God is speaking to you now, the church, the the altar is open to you. Whatever prayer you need to pray, it's right here. I invite you this morning.